Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm, you, you know, we went through this back in 2005. At that time, uh, we were a majority and I was the chairman. Um, it, we had a successful uh, effort then, but that was what, 286.4 billion, I believe. Initially, it was gonna be a six-year bill and a five-year bill, I guess. And yet, at that time, we had really good testimony. I remember some of you, maybe some of the same ones, I think Gary, you were here at that time, saying that amount of money really just maintains what we have now. Uh, it, it, it's just, and so what we're talking about here, it's not as if we're saying that the, uh, uh, to drop 12 billion over a two year period is going to uh, in, inflict some kind of hardship. We're saying even at the full funding, it's not adequate. And that's a cons coming from a conservative, and I, I, I feel strongly about that. I remember so well when we, when they had the $800 billion um, um, stimulus bill, and uh, we're down on the floor, and, and I, I couldn't believe that only, as was mentioned by Senator Sessions, only 3.5% of that actually went to what we're talking about today. And so we had an amendment. You talk about being uh, bipartisan. The chairman and I had an amendment to take that, uh, I'm going from memory now, it was 29 billion uh, up to 79 billion. And I was gonna ask, you know, where do you think we'd be today if we'd been successful in that effort? But that, that still would have been only 10% of the $800 billion stimulus. And I, it's just mind boggling to me that when we, it was such an easy thing at that time to do and we didn't do it. We just don't wanna make that mistake. No. Uh, again, um, I'm going to start with um, uh, Secretary Ridley because we talked about this before. I think that uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Martinovich would agree that what, how this affects Oklahoma would affect uh, probably all the rest of her member um, uh, states. In the event, uh, Gary, that we had to do the 34% the cut from current level, and that's what we're talking about. Uh, Specifically, what would that mean in Oklahoma? Thank you, Senator. Uh, certainly the uh, impact would be uh, uh, devastating to our eight-year construction work plan. We put together an eight-year plan that's fiscally constrained based on the uh, monies that we will receive at the state level as well as the anticipated revenues at the federal level considering current statutes, current law. Uh, so if you have a basically one-third reduction of the uh, federal funds, and the federal funds make up 60% of our eight-year construction work program, uh, one would have to, if you do the math, you're looking at somewhere around 750 to $800 million would come out of that eight-year construction work program. So you have about a one point, or a 4.1 program would have to be reduced by $800 million. Uh, certainly there's some projects that you could probably look to rescope and reduce the length of them. But in that program, we have 650 bridges uh, that we'll either replace or rehabilitate. I can't reduce the length of those, as you might expect. Uh, they are what they are. And it would certainly uh, put all projects within that eight-year program at risk of being either reduced in size or scope or being pushed either out of the eight-year program or certainly being moved. Uh, would there be a specific program in our state of Oklahoma that you could just real quickly address as to what that difference that would make in that project? We have, as you know, some huge ones in Oklahoma City and in Tulsa and elsewhere. And, and you're absolutely right, uh, Senator. We have a project in Oklahoma City. It's the relocation of the I-40 uh, Crosstown Bridge. And we're getting close to be able to take traffic off of that critical bridge and get them on a uh, new main line. But with that requires us to reconnect the downtown area of Oklahoma City back to Interstate 40, Interstate 235, uh, and Interstate I-35. Uh, we're scheduled to have that completed by 2014. One would imagine that, that again, that project uh, and those series of projects would have to be delayed. In Tulsa, the same way. We have a section of interstate uh, commonly referred to as Skelly Bypass, Riverside, Yale, uh, that's a $340 million project that we have the last project is scheduled for letting about this time next year. If we have this major reduction in federal funds, one could imagine that that could very well be a project that we would have to delay. That is the oldest section of interstate that we have in our system. In fact, it was in place before the interstate system 
uh, was established, so it was surplanted on top of an existing highway. The high accident rate, uh, high severity rate, uh, and high fatality rate in that area, and some of the worst on our interstate system. Delaying that completion of that project would not only cause uh, additional costs, but certainly you could expect to have uh, additional accidents, both personal injury and maybe even fatalities, any delays that we would have, you could certainly uh, uh, expect that. All right, and, and then I'd like to ask uh, maybe uh, Mr. James, or it could be just about anyone, the alternative, uh, that we, if we were to deal with just more extensions as opposed to a bridge, and even if the money were the same amount, uh, in addition to just the reforms that we have in there, what other problems, uh, Ms. Martinovich, uh, do, do you see that would be there? In other words, we spend the same amount of money, but we do it just with extensions. Thank you, Senator. The, the biggest problem is not being able to plan. Mm -hmm. As a transportation official, I don't know when the money exactly would come or even how much because of the, what the unknown times are or what the criteria is. And assuming it's all the same, I still will be hesitant to put out any projects that are past that, not knowing if I'm <coughs> going to be reimbursed on time and, and then supplementing paying those contractors with our state money. So it's, it's a balancing act and, and the planning act and so if I can't plan how can our customers plan how can the contractors know and set up their resources how can the supplies even be available not knowing do they do they make a lot or do they be reactive and so then that delay could impact time. yeah well that's what I'm trying to get it because we have a lot of things the predictability uh, that's in here and what that how that translates into what we're going to be able to get from a bill and we have the flexibility and in terms of the state's uh, activities and these things so I, I guess what I'm saying is we have a lot of really good uh, reforms some of them were easy some of them we didn't agree on uh, in the beginning but that to me is just almost as important as the amount of money to be able to predictably uh, see it and and I and, and I, I, I want to thank you Mr. O'Sullivan too my time has expired but I just want to tell you that I appreciate your being here and in, 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 in bringing to the table the fact that we have thousands and thousands of jobs out there. And I often wonder, and maybe you put the pencil to this, I don't know, but if we had been successful in changing that $29 billion to $79 billion, how many more jobs today would there be actively working on? You know? Put your mic on. Um, if we use the statistics of 34,000 jobs created for every billion, um, there would be an awful lot more jobs. There would be less unemployment in the construction industry. Um, and just the, the question about what would happen as far as the Department of, State Department of Transportation, from the labor perspective, we already have a 15.6% unemployment rate in the construction industry today, down from 20%, uh, 1 1.3 million construction workers out of work. From the unionized sector, we've lost 30,000 members in the last two years. Um, and unfortunately, over half of those were construction laborers working on heavy and highway projects that had eight or more years of service in the industry. So as the unemployment goes, rate goes up, and it's, this has been a sustained depression or recession in the construction industry, one that we really haven't witnessed in a, a real long time. And we're seeing an exodus of skilled craftsmen and women leave in the industry that makes it difficult when the money is there uh, to rebound and to rebuild the crumbling infrastructure in this country. So the skills drain in this country because of the prolonged recession in the construction industry um, is, a, is, a, is a real problem. Well, I so appreciate your asking that question. I went, I went to, okay. go ahead. Our committee, I mean, our, our witnesses here, this is really unusual. We've got everybody covered we do. here. We do. And so I, I, you know, I express to you my appreciation for working on this, uh, this input that we're getting. Well, it is extraordinary. I, I went about a year ago to a job retraining center in the Central Valley, and I, it, one of the programs was learning how to chef. And... I went around the room, and at least in that room of about 25, 30 wor working people were at least 10 who said they were construction people, and um, imagine, and they just plain had given up. So your point is poignant, and it's accurate. 
and I thank you for it. Uh, Senator Whitehouse.